As we explained before in Chapter 6a, Muhammad's alleged revelations during his Meccan period were conciliatory, intelligent, moral, and meaningful, but all of a sudden they started becoming hate-mongering, war-mongering, and downright racist and uncompromising. When and what triggered his change of mind? It was the accumulation of several factors that led to Muhammad's frustration regarding his own perceived prophetic mission. Most people do not know that he spent almost 13 years of his life preaching and exhorting his message to all those who would listen to him among his own tribe of Quraysh, but was only able to convert about 78 men and women, most of whom were close friends and their slaves. 13 years that ended with the most abysmal of results. The Meccan pagans, his own tribe, refused to follow him for good reasons, I may add, since it was he who was the first in attacking, insulting, and denigrating all their beliefs that they had been holding for centuries. It was he who was telling them that all their ancestors are burning in hell. It was he who asserted that their children, because they were born in unbelief, were suffering the torments of hell. It was he who was changing their traditional tribal and filial loyalties to insurrection and insubordination, pitting sons against fathers, brothers against sisters, servants against masters. It was he who split first his Arabians into two warring camps, those of the so-called believers against those of the so-called unbelievers. It was Muhammad in his Quran who divided the humanity into two groups, those of the so-called believers eternally fighting, forcefully converting, subjugating or annihilating the majority of human beings called unbelievers. It is his followers who project this aggression and the supreme but totally unwarranted and baseless sense of superiority upon the remainder of humanity, showing them neither respect nor mercy or compassion, as we see on our TV screens and read about in our newsprint every day all over the globe. Muhammad was satirized, ridiculed and insulted by his own family and tribe because they knew very well that he was plagiarizing, plundering, pirating and or perverting stories that they themselves had already heard during the Uqaz fairs from Judaized and Christianized Arabs. Contrary to all the lies and perversions of facts created by the followers of Muhammad against the pagan Arabs, they could have had him slaughtered at any time they chose to, but did not do so to one of their own whom they considered possessed by evil spirits. They were of course right in their analysis, but never would have believed the depraved degree that he would in the end stoop to to achieve his own selfish agenda. It was a very unfortunate error of judgment for the pagan Arabs that they showed infinitely greater mercy, compassion and decency towards the renegade Muhammad than he later showed to them. It is typical of Muhammadan Muslims who live in a culture of total denial to conveniently ignore the fact that it was Muhammad who initiated the attacks and aggression against his own people and not the other way around. Can any of our listeners, be they Muhammadans or otherwise, have any doubt as to what would happen to any human being who would publicly declare in any Muhammadan Muslim state that Islam is garbage, or that Muhammad is a fraud, or that Allah is not God? Just in case we have any doubters, Please remember what the followers of Muhammad did all over the Muhammadan world and Europe just because of some silly cartoons depicting Muhammad as a terrorist. Yet the same Muhammadan believers show great outrage and an incredible level of hypocrisy at the opposition shown by the pagan Arabs to Muhammad's humiliating insults and attacks at their core belief systems and of religion 1400 years ago. When Muhammad received what they call the second pledge of Aqaba, from the Aws and Khazraj tribes of al Medina, that they would protect him as they would their women and children, Muhammad henceforth had able-bodied and believing mercenaries to do his bidding. He had thus instantly been turned from a weak and helpless individual to a chieftain of a militant and organized crime syndicate. It was at that very moment of his life, and just before he left Mecca to al Medina to join his new allies, that he conveniently revealed the first fighting verses to be followed by hundreds upon hundreds more later on. al Tawbah 9.5 But when the forbidden months are past, then fight, slay, faqtulu, 
the pagans, wherever ye find them, and seize them, beleaguer them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. So much for Muhammad's version of peaceful Islam. Al-Baqarah 2.190 Fight, qatilu in the cause of Allah, those who fight you, yuqatilunakum, and fight them, waqatiluhum on until there is no more tumult or oppression. Fighting, al-qital is prescribed for you, although you dislike it. Al-Anfal 8.39 And fight with them, waqatiluhum, until there is no more persecution and religion should be only for Allah. Al-Saf 61.4 Surely Allah loves those who fight yuqatiluna in his way. This word qatl and its derivatives are repeated in the Quran and Hadith at least 35,213 times. Sahih al-Bukhari 4.256 narrated by As-Sab bin Jathama. The Prophet was asked whether it was permissible to attack the pagan warriors at night with the probability of exposing their women and children to danger. The Prophet replied, they, i.e. the women and children, are from them, i.e. pagans. In this command, Muhammad establishes that it is permissible to kill non-combatants in the process of killing a perceived enemy. This provides justification for the many Islamic terror bombings. Sahih al-Bukhari 4.220 narrated by Abu Huraira. Allah's Apostle said, I have been made victorious with terror. Sunan Abu Dawood Hadith 2635 narrated by Anas bin Malik. The Prophet said, I am commanded to fight with men till they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his servant and his apostle. Face our Qibla, the direction of prayer, eat what we slaughter and pray like us. Far from being mere theological construct or history, the violent verses of the Quran have played a key role in the many massacres in Muhammadan history, including the brutal slaughter of tens of millions of Hindus for five centuries, beginning around 1000 AD with Mahmud of Ghazni's bloody conquest. Buddhism was very nearly wiped off the Indian subcontinent. Judaism made the same fate in the Middle East as did Christianity, there as well as across North Africa and parts of Europe, including Turkey. Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion of a proud Persian people, is despised by Muhammadans and barely survives in modern Iran. So ingrained is violence in the cult of Muhammadan Islam, it has never really stopped being at war either with other religions or with itself. As a piratical leader, he inspired his followers to do battle even when they did not feel it was right to fight, threatening them with hell if they did not, promising them slaves and booty if they did. Muhammad and his men invariably raped traumatized women captured in battle just after having had their menfolk slaughtered in front of their eyes. Muhammadan apologists often claim that Muhammadan Islam only attacked in self-defense. This is not only an oxymoron, but it is flatly contradicted by the accounts of their wars of aggression as recorded by their historians and others going back to the time of Muhammad. The most obscenely untrue statement that can be said about Muhammadan Islam is that it is a religion of peace. If every standard by which the West is judged and condemned, slavery, imperialism, intolerance, women's rights, warfare, were applied equally to it, the verdict would be absolutely devastating. Muhammadan Islam never gives up what it conquers, be it religion, culture, language or life. Muhammadan Islam never makes apologies or any real effort at moral progress regarding its misdeeds. It is the least open to dialogue and the most self-absorbed. It is convinced of its own perfection, yet never open to critical examination. This is what makes the verses of violence so dangerous. They are given the weight of divine command. Jihad is central to the cult of Muhammad. It is the unannounced, Sixth pillar of Muhammadan Islam. Speaking of peace and love may win over the ignorant, but when every twelfth verse of the Quran either speaks of Allah's hatred for non-Muslims or calls for their death, forced conversion or subjugation, it's little wonder that sympathy for terrorism runs as deeply as it does in the broader community. Even if most Muhammadans on the personal level prefer not to interpret their belief system in this way. For their part, Western liberals would do well 
not to sacrifice judgment and distinction on the altar of political correctness or look for reasons to bring other religions down to the level of Muhammadan Islam merely to avoid the existential truth that this is, it is both different and dangerous. Muhammad's Quran is full of warmongering, hate-mongering, satanic and racist verses that could not have been possibly emanating from any omniscient, compassionate and merciful divine entity. This 1400 years old unilateral declaration of total war against all and sundry continues unabated up to the present moment.